So I put it up to a vote and like 97% of you, well, the 97% of you that voted, wanted to see an Optiplex GPU selection video. So that's what we're doing today. And the results might actually surprise you, especially the power draw numbers. Now this video is really geared to the Optiplex 20 series with a fourth gen Haswell i5, um, but this can really be applied to any system with a Haswell i5. The goal being 1080p gaming at 60 frames per second. Our test system is a 9020 with an i5 4590 and eight gigs of RAM. Now, if you're looking at getting or have a Haswell i7, then realistically, you're more being limited by your budget since it's not going to have any problem feeding any of the GPUs that we have on the table today. And before I begin, just a reminder that timestamps will be down in the description. Now to make my decision, I wanted to tackle this from a few different angles. The first being power consumption. Which of these can we reasonably run off the stock 290 watt power supply? Next, I wanted to look at bottlenecking potential. You know, at what point does our i5 start to bottleneck these graphics cards? Then we want to look at gaming performance and how any potential bottlenecks affect actual gameplay. And lastly, we want to factor in cost and what kind of value we're getting when taking performance into account. Now we have a handful of GPUs we'll be testing starting with uh, the AMD RX 464 gig. And this one has dedicated six pin PCI power, which does make a difference. Um, but I also have an RX uh, 578 gig as well as an RX 488 gig. On the NVIDIA side, we'll be testing the 1050 Ti 4 gig. Yes, it's a low profile model that I scavenged out of my um, system that I currently have sitting under my workbench but we'll also be testing a 1060 um, 6 gig as well as a 3 gig and i also have a 1660 6 gig as well as a 1070 that i'm going to test anyways let's jump right in and take a look at power consumption these figures are all total system power draw from the outlet at idle as well as load measured using a watt meter keep in mind that um, what the power supply draws from the wall is going to be higher than what the components are actually drawing from the power supply. Starting with the low end, we have the 1050 Ti, which sips power with the system pulling 31 watts at idle and a max pull of 146 watts. Next is the RX 460, which measured 35 watts at idle and a max of 169 watts under load. Then we have the 1063 gig with an idle draw of 30 watts and a max of 202 watts. The 1660 was a little higher at idle, pulling 35 watts and barely higher at max, measuring 204. Now the 1066 gig drew 33 watts at idle and really jumped at max to 233 watts. Surprisingly, the 1070 um, only drew 40 watts at idle, but barely pulled more than the uh, 1066 gig with a max of 243 watts. I should note that this is a DT, which consumes less power than uh, regular 1070s that I've tested in the past. Uh, the DT models are how EVGA deals with poor quality silicon. I'm guessing it's running at lower clocks and thus pulling less juice as a result. Now we have the heavy hitters. The RX 570 drew 40 watts at idle and maxed out at 264 watts. But the RX 40 takes the cake with an idle of 41 watts and a max power draw of 279 watts from the outlet. I will note that these were all tested initially on a Corsair CX750M first, just to be safe. After seeing those numbers, I retested on the stock 290 watt unit, and those are the numbers that you're seeing. The figures on the uh, 750 watt were just a bit lower due to the fact that the uh, 250 watt unit I'm testing with doesn't have an 80 plus certification, and the 750 watt is 80 plus bronze. So it is a little bit more efficient. Um, now you might be wondering how I ran all of these off the stock power supply. Well, I used one of these serial ATA to PCI Express uh, adapters. <laughs> and I know there are people watching this right now that just lost their crap. But I monitored the temps of this cable, um, the wires, and I found that they didn't get any hotter than the wires feeding the main ATX and CPU power did. Um, these things are perfectly fine to a point. Moving on, let's look at bottlenecking. This is an often misunderstood subject that so many people have no clue what it really is. And there are some that are suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect where they think that they do, but they don't. 
And what people are typically referring to when they say bottleneck in reference to gaming is that the GPU is waiting on the CPU for information, keeping the GPU from being fully utilized. I really want to get into more detail here, but this really needs its own video. Anyways, we're going to look at each GPU separately, and we tested in four games. First, I decided on Doom, set to Ultra in OpenGL. Now, yes, Doom is very well optimized and unlikely to show a bottleneck. However, uh, I thought it would be a good example to show of what isn't a bottleneck. Then I tested in Rise of the Tomb Raider, Far Cry 5, and one I figured would be guaranteed to show us a bottleneck, Battlefield 5. All of these on the high preset. Let's start with the RX 460. As I expected, in every game tested, the GPU stayed at 100% utilization, uh, with dips here and there. These are normal and don't indicate a bottleneck. The CPU never maxed out and was typically within the 60-70% to 70 range. Next we have the 1050 Ti, and we're seeing more of the same, with the GPU staying at 100% with normal utilization dips. Uh, the CPU was expectedly utilized a little more, uh, typically within the 70 to 85% range, but did peak to 100% during the uh, Tomb Raider test. However, there was no correlating GPU utilization drop, and there really is no observed bottleneck with either of these cards. Moving on to the 1063 gig, we can see quite a jump here. In Doom, the GPU utilization really drops, and this is really the trend for the rest of the GPUs tested in Doom, and is also not an indication of a bottleneck. What is happening here is the game engine not really utilizing the GPU fully at this resolution, and uh, how game engines leverage the GPU versus the CPU can vary greatly. Uh, speaking of which, the CPU was also never fully utilized. In Tomb Raider, we see the CPU max out at 100% and a correlating GPU utilization drop. Bottlenecks aren't always easy to differentiate from game engine utilization drops, but this seems to be a CPU to GPU bottleneck though it's very slight. In Far Cry 5, the CPU managed to max out on this test as well, but uh, there was no correlating GPU drop. I'm not sure I would call this a CPU bottleneck as the GPU dips happened at the same points with the 1050 Ti and the RX 480, just to a larger degree. In Battlefield 5, I'm actually surprised. We see the CPU maxing out, but the GPU also remains maxed. So we're really towing the line here in Battlefield, and uh, we have a very slight bottleneck in Tomb Raider. However, this is nothing that will ruin your gameplay, which we'll look at in performance. The 1066 gig is really the exact same story as the 3 gig model. Uh, normal lower GPU utilization drops in Doom, uh, slight uh, bottleneck in Tomb Raider, game engine drops in Far Cry 5, and Riding the Edge in Battlefield 5. Uh, switching gears back to AMD, we're looking at the RX 570, and we see the same story in Doom. Uh, Tomb Raider, we see a similar story, but I feel like we're seeing more of a bottleneck here. In Far Cry 5, I still believe these are normal game engine drops and not a bottleneck. In Battlefield 5, we're seeing the same story as well. The CPU never maxed out, but it came close. However, the GPU managed to stay maxed out for the entire run with an occasional dip here and there. The RX 480 is a similar story to the 570, no bottleneck in Doom, with performance being almost identical in Tomb Raider. In Far Cry 5, we see a couple of GPU utilization drops that correlate with CPU spikes, which could indicate a potential slight bottleneck. In Battlefield 5, we can see a clear bottleneck, with the CPU maxing out at times with the GPU dipping as low as 89%. Next up is the 1660, which continues the trend with no bottleneck in Doom. However, in the other three, we're seeing a pretty clear bottleneck at times. In Tomb Raider, the GPU utilization dropped to 83% at one point. In Far Cry 5, it dipped as low as 72%, and in Battlefield 5, it only dipped to 91%, all with 100% CPU utilization. While there is a clear bottleneck here, it's still slight. Last, we have the 1070. We can now finally see the limits of the Haswell i5. Even Doom is starting to feel the heat, with the CPU reaching 96%. In correlation with the performance figures, I believe we're starting to see a bottleneck here in uh, Doom. In Tomb Raider, there is no question with the CPU staying maxed out the majority of the time and the GPU hitting 100% occasionally. 
In Far Cry 5, the CPU wasn't hit as hard as Tomb Raider, but we're still seeing a pretty clear bottleneck with the GPU never hitting 100%, with the CPU maxing out at times and sitting mostly in the 90% range. In Battlefield 5, we're seeing the clearest definition of a CPU bottleneck. The CPU stayed maxed out at 100% the entire time, with the GPU peaking occasionally to 95%, but usually down more in the 80% range. Now, let's look at how this all affected gaming performance. Starting with the Heaven scores, to get a baseline, I just did 5 runs and then averaged the score. I'm running at 1080p full screen, 8x AA, extreme tessellization, and extreme quality. As you can see, we get a pretty linear climb, save for the 1660. Now, Heaven is a GPU benchmark, and is not really going to demonstrate a CPU bottleneck. So the 1660 score is a little odd and should be more in the 1700 to 1800 range. I tested this multiple times and I didn't get a different result. Um, this is a lower end Zotac card and perhaps that's just an indication of that. So do these scores directly translate into real world gaming performance with the Haswell i5? Not necessarily. Now I tested each of these games with five passes and just like heaven, uh, averaged the scores. Game settings were the same across power, bottleneck, and performance testing. What we're looking for here are average frame rates, but we also want to look at the 1% and 0.1% lows, which can help us identify a bottleneck, as well as if a bottleneck really matters from a gameplay perspective. We don't want to just see higher frame rates. More importantly, we want to see the 1% and 0.1% lows as high as we can while being as close to each other as we can. Um, if those numbers are... Um, really low or a large spread between each other. This means we're getting dropped frames, which translates to choppier gameplay. Looking at Doom, we can see most everything looks pretty good here. The 1660 isn't really doing any better than the 1066 gig, and while the 1070 had a higher average frame rate, the 0.1% and 1% lows were slightly lower than the 1060, which supports the idea that the i5 is bottlenecking the 1070 in Doom. However, all of these cards provide a relatively consistent gameplay experience. Moving on to Tomb Raider, we can see that Laura Croft must really not like AMD. Seems that perhaps she's an Nvidia shill, as we're seeing quite a dip on the 1% and 0.1% lows on the AMD cards over their Nvidia counterparts. This is during the last two sections of the benchmark test. Um, the first section actually runs quite smooth. Now, we did see a slight bottleneck with the 570 and the 480, and that's certainly a contributing factor, but I think there's more to this than that, as we see the same issue with the 460, and we know there's no bottleneck there. Um, on all of the AMD cards, you'd expect to see frame drops here and there in certain situations in Tomb Raider. Uh, seems to be more of an issue in the interior sections. On the Nvidia side, we can see a linear drop in 1% and 1% lows as we climb the stack, showing the effects of bottlenecking, but not really affecting gameplay much. In Far Cry 5, we uh, pretty much have what I was expecting from my bottlenecking analysis. Gameplay should be pretty consistent on all of these GPUs, but we can see the effects of bottlenecking taking a slight toll on the 1070's performance. In Battlefield 5, it's really the same story as Far Cry 5, except we can see bottlenecking really starting to affect the 480 over the 570 and we can really see that trend continue with the 1070. Though I did play through this entire level with the uh, 1070 after testing and the experience wasn't terrible, you'll just have to deal with frame dips here and there. Now the last thing that I want to look at is price to performance. All the prices here are taken from eBay sold listings and then I average them. Now before you attempt to destroy me in the comments, keep in mind that I can't know what you can get these for locally in your areas, especially outside the US. Keeping in mind that we only have four games that we tested in, do not attempt to compare these numbers to other people's figures. These are just to compare these GPUs for the purposes of this specific video. Now, looking at these numbers, we can get an idea of value, but this should be taken with a grain of salt, and I'll elaborate in my conclusions. One thing I want to talk about here is the 1660. I feel like it's a bit skewed, since my example isn't really performing where I would expect it to. Taking this all into account, the 460 isn't a great choice. 
even if you get one at the low end, the cost per frame is still going to be higher than a 1063 gig. And you're probably gonna be getting a model that doesn't have a dedicated PCIe power and will perform worse than the one that I tested here. Plus, it's just not a great option for 1080p gaming at 60 frames per second uh, without a lot of compromises in some cases. I would say that this card is really more suited for 900p. The same can be kind of said for the 1050 Ti. While it does make a good entry-level 1080p card, its cost per frame is too high. Even if this were a regular model with a 6-pin uh, PCI power, which is what I used in my calculations, the increase in performance wouldn't beat out the 1063 gig as they're about the same price. The 1063 gig, while it's almost the best in price to performance, only has 3 gigabytes of VRAM, which will be an issue in some games. I really don't recommend going under 4 gigs, as these days in modern titles it can become an issue. And even though it's a little bit more expensive, I feel like the 6 gigabyte model is worth it um, for the added cost. The 1660 is an anomaly. Like I said, I feel like it should be performing better. A better performing model at $200 would have better priced performance, but it would also be bottlenecked more than the model I had giving you a worse gaming experience compared to the 1060s. The RX 570 is a great value when you consider performance. However, its power draw is pretty high, beating out even the 1070. Granted, uh, like I said, it's a DT, but this still gives me pause to recommend it, as it's on the limit of what I would suggest, as the components are probably pulling more around 240 watts, but that's still not really much of a buffer zone on the stock power supply. That means that the 480 is a no-go due to power draw alone. And I feel that the lowest cost per frame of the group really is irrelevant due to that fact. Besides, it's not really performing much better than the 570 anyways. Lastly, the 1070 is, is an easy decision. While it's perfectly playable, you're paying more for worse performance than uh, the 1060 in cases because of the effects of bottlenecking. So while you can, it just doesn't make much sense with one of these 4th uh, gen i5s. It would honestly be better to move up to an i7 at this point. Um, and also the card I tested with could be run on the 290 watt power supply. I still wouldn't recommend it, especially a regular model like the SC for example. But in conclusion, picking a GPU that's good for both smooth 1080p gameplay at 60 frames per second and also being able to be used on the 290 watt power supply, I've just got to go with the 1060 6 gig um, as, as being the ideal choice. It's only going to be bottlenecked by the i5 slightly in some games and not enough to make a meaningful difference. It's a decent price and you can find them for sometimes around $120. However, don't pay more than 140 for one. Also, it's perfectly fine to run on the stock power supply so long as you absolutely do not overclock it. Um, had the three gigabyte model had four gigs, of VRAM, uh, four gigs of VRAM, it might have been my suggestion instead. The 570 gets an honorable mention and I know what you're thinking. You really could just spend the extra money on a new power supply, but I mean, I do realize that the 1060 and the 570 do trade blows depending on the game, but with the 24 to 8 pin adapter that you'd have to buy, um, as well as the power supply, you're not really going to get anything good for that price difference. If you're on a super tight budget, you're really cutting it close as far as power consumption is concerned, but I guess it's doable. But I would still suggest the 1060 if you can swing the extra dough. So there you have it, and I'm sure that there are plenty of people ready and willing to, to explain to me why I'm wrong, so go ahead and do that down in the comments. Um, also, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them there. I do try to respond to everyone. Uh, if you like this or found it useful, maybe toss it a like and consider subbing to see future videos. Uh, the Budget Optiplex video will be out shortly. I know you guys have been waiting very patiently for that. Anyways, guys, I'm out, and I'll see you with the next video.